the back. All right. Underground transportation has been associated with darkness, unhealthy condition, and distance from life on the surface. Designs for new stations attempted to bring natural light down <clears throat> to the platforms, but have succeeded mainly where the structure is only one story deep. As systems burrow deeper, uh, bringing in daylight becomes even more difficult. And the illustration to the left is a government center in Boston, uh, newly renovated with wider uh, stairway and a uh, greenhouse type of headhouse to bring light uh, down, essentially one story underground. And so this is one of the oldest stations uh, in the country and built by cut and cover. So it's um, shallow as subways go. Uh, research for buildings above ground has shown that it's possible to collect, transport, and distribute direct sun to the interior of a structure, even to underground spaces. Our research program attempted to build on this knowledge by investigating possible new techniques for directing sunlight to transit station platforms and other facilities far underground to further sustainable design approaches. So uh, on the left is a design guide on active port sunlighting for buildings. I was uh, an advisory member of the Committee of the Illuminating Engineering Society. We uh, we'll be looking at a passive port tunneling system. And uh, the purpose of our research and innovation fellowship was to identify a project that could benefit from the use of core sunlighting and to find potential core sunlighting solutions for that facility. Around the time of the award, WSP published a planning study for the existing Pennsylvania station in New York City to be known as Empire Penn Station. And you see it's an alternatives report and there are four alternatives shown on the cover. And we explored one of them. So, uh, and there's history in uh, case you're wondering why one would want to consider so many options and, and a renovation. Elliot? Sure, so to talk a little bit about that history, um, here's a picture of the old Penn Station, uh, which was filled with space and light. Uh, daylight enters the concourse through this large, massive uh, glass roof that we see in, in the picture here, and then filters down through the track level through openings in the concourse um, that we, we can also see in the picture. Also notice how the floor of the concourse um, has embedded with it glass tiles. So that allowed even the covered areas of the concourse to experience daylight and reach down to the track level. Next slide. But unfortunately, as many of us know from our architectural history classes, uh, this urban landmark was demolished in 1963. Uh, it helped launch the historic preservation uh, movement in the US, but was a, a sad loss uh, for uh, the urban environment. Next, next slide. So uh, right now, uh, Penn Station still exists, um, but all the tracks have been covered over. And, and so it's all below grade. And what sits on top of it is Madison Square Garden. Um, and uh, obviously all of Penn Station is underground. If you could advance that one. one yep, so that's where I am right now. Uh, across the street, our WSP NYC office is, uh, is located right across. So we're, we're kind of watching all the transformation that's happening in and around uh, Penn Station and Madison Square Garden as, as we're working on it. Next slide, please. So this is a cross section of what it looks like and 
you can see Madison Square Garden sits above the transit station, really limiting access to daylight uh, for commuters. Now, the new proposals that are coming out are, are all meant uh, to bring in daylight uh, into the entranceways and improve the interior organization and provide more space for the estimated uh, 650,000 daily commuters, although that number is probably pre-pandemic. Um, so a lot of people coming through the station and not a lot of uh, access to natural light. Next slide, please. And you can see here's a picture on uh, of one of the 21 different tracks that Penn Station serves. And you could see how in contrast to that first picture, even though it was arguably of the same platforms and trains, that there's uh, you know, a, a very different inter interior environment uh, than the original Penn Station with no access to natural light, really depending on artificial light. Next slide. And uh, many of you might be familiar with this quote, uh, but the change to Penn Station and putting it all uh, underground prompted the architectural historian Vincent Scully to remark that one entered the city like a god in relationship to the old Penn Station. And now uh, with everything below grade one and, and very dim, uh, one scuttles in now like a rat. So the, even the, the new renovation isn't going to be able to restore the, the for, former uh, splendor of the of Penn Station, but at least are looking for opportunities to improve things and, and bring in more access to natural light. Next slide. So assuming the use of vertical tubular elements, uh, the first design challenge was to find one or more paths to the platforms from the roof. After reviewing plans and a model and visiting the site, the team determined that the best approach was to follow the ventilation shaft. And so you can see progressing from, whoa, sorry, progressing from, we'll get back to it, left to right, uh, the roof plan uh, at the left, there are two yellow dots on the plan. Those are ventilation shafts. And you can see moving from left to right how we propose to uh, move from the roof to the street level, to the concourse level, the ticketing level, and then finally down to the platform. Uh, we investigated this path also in section. You see the sunlight collector up at the roof, a uh, vertical tube conductor going through the various floors, and finally a set of sunlight distributing tubes down at the platform level. And a precedent uh, was a, a renovation project in Minneapolis, a Thresher Square building. This uh, resulted in a passive solar optical system using base materials that would be familiar to any building contractor. Uh, the folks who did this, uh, BRW Architects, uh, had done an active uh, solar design for a building at uh, University of Minnesota, chemical and mineral engineering building. They got frustrated with active systems and decided to try a passive one. So they figured out this double mirror system. And I uh, took that as a model, uh, as a precedent. And I was also interested in coming up with design solutions that use products that are readily available or assemblies made of readily available materials. So uh, simulating the path of beam sunlight, the team modeled a collector made of flat rectangular mirrors, like in the building you just saw. And I built a, a school study model that you see on the left 
And then I realized we needed, of course, to do a virtual model uh, and the lighting uh, programs that we typically use uh, can't handle specular reflections. So we think of reflections in terms of specular versus matte surfaces. We think of specular reflection versus diffuse reflection. Uh, the lighting modeling programs assume all surfaces are diffusing, they're all matte. So they appear equally bright from all angles. A mirror appears bright only at the reflected angle from the light source. And uh, I didn't have a way to model that. So I went looking and I found Elliot. And Elliot said that he could model a specular reflection. And that's what you see on the right is the model that he created, uh, beaming sunlight uh, through a double mirrored system into a tube going down through the various floors of the station. So, yeah, it, our research continued to follow the path of beam sunlight to the platform level. The collector and the vertical tube are centered on a platform. Uh, we created a virtually a beam splitter below the vertical tube and then a lateral tube to direct sunlight to the platform edges. And at the platform edges, another beam splitter distributes the sunlight to translucent tubes that direct and diffuse the light. These tubes or light pipes are made with special optical film inside that distributes the light evenly along the entire length of the tube from a light source at one end. So this is tricky. It's a special device that is able to distribute light uh, evenly, even though the light source is only at one end of the device. And while modeling the system, uh, it was discovered that the collector that we had envisioned initially as a custom construction could be replaced in the model with a standard product. Uh, and this would be a version of the solar tube product line. <clears throat> so preliminary step in understanding how much sunlight might actually be captured by the collector is to calculate the illuminance at the bottom of the vertical tube. This was done in a sensitivity analysis by Elliot, studying a variety of collectors at key dates and times throughout the year. And he came up with one model that did the job best. And then uh, at the same time, the model was refined uh, to show more architectural detail. And above is a three-dimensional model, view of the model at the platform level that uh, Ilya created from CAD plan in the script. And here's a plan view. Uh, typical platform has tracks on both sides. You see the tactile edge, the yellow stripe on each side. There's a vertical collector coming down from the roof. Uh, light goes into a horizontal transfer tube and then down to the light pipe where it distributes light along the platform. And here is uh, the three-dimensional assembly with uh, the collector at the top, the sunlight beam down through the vertical tube by internal reflection uh, through all the floors. We've, we've left the actual floors out of the image for clarity so you can see the whole light distribution system. And then there's a light pipe diffusing sunlight at the platform. So we took a step back to say, well, is this real? Is this realistic? How do we keep it constructible? We looked at fire. Our main concern was fire resistance because we figured, well, people make ducts all the time and we picked a standard product 
Now we were, knew we were dealing with the solar tube collector and its vertical pipe. So we wondered how do we uh, keep it fire resistant? We uh, first looked at fire rated glass, which can create a rated and insulating barrier within the duct and allow light to pass. The illustration below shows a sample of the product Pilkington Pyrostaw uh, to the right in front of an office window. Daylight transmittance is 75% as advertised and as I measured at the sample. Uh, color rendering capability remains high with a uh, CRI of 95 on a scale of 100. And my visible assessment was that there's a very slight blue or green tint to the glass, which is common. So this was, a, I think, a good material. Uh, then another approach is uh, to wrap the duct in gypsum board. That's probably something some of you are familiar with. Uh, possible product is the USG shaft wall, shown in the illustration. It's commonly used to protect mechanical chases and elevator shafts. And then uh, an approach used in renovations where you have to be a little more flexible is uh, an insulating wrap, such as the 3M fire barrier duct wrap. And again, protecting the duct from the outside. Okay, so our team used the following software to create virtual models, potential for lighting solutions. 3D, 3D Studio Max was used to create and modify 3D models. Rhino was used to analyze reflective behavior of the light inside a mirror tube. Grasshopper scripting allowed the analyses in Rhino to be performed. And Climate Studio used within Grasshopper facilitated environmental analysis. And Uh, we started with 3D Studio Max, which is a virtual 3D modeling program uh, that was used to perform feasibility of light pipe pathways from the roof of the train station to the train platform. Here, we're just dealing with objects. We weren't dealing with light reflection. Uh, so to do this, a virtual 3D model of Penn Station was received uh, with cooperation of the planning team and imported into 3D Studio Max. Some missing components had to be replaced and uh, geometry representing the light pipes were added to the scene. The paths of light pipe were then reviewed to determine practicality. And, uh, it went over to the site to have a look. And he'll tell you now uh, uh, the details of the workflow. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so to add a little bit of a uh, deeper dive to that overview of our workflow and how we utilize all these different softwares, all the subsequent modeling and performance analysis took place in Grasshopper. Uh, many of you on the call might be familiar with Grasshopper, but for those that aren't, it's a visual algorithm editor that allows the generation of parametric geometry within the 3D uh, modeling software uh, Rhino. So the parametric capabilities uh, that Grasshopper has allows for the rapid study of multiple design iterations just by either varying the parameters that are fed into this logic tree that you would create or varying the algorithm itself. Uh, another advantage to Grasshopper is that it has a variety of plugins that are available for it for everything from structural to environmental analysis. So it becomes uh, an environment where you can incorporate a lot of different aspects of design into one platform. And many of these are also open source tools. Uh, so you could modify them and uh, take advantage of them. So the, it really creates this custom open source nature, uh, uh, well, environment that, that is Grasshopper. And we utilize that to allow us to study the daylight that we would be bringing back, bringing down to the track level while generating um, our own uh, 
post analysis of the data and custom visualizations. Next slide, please. Um, so the first step that we took uh, was like in that slide that Jeff showed before about the, um, the specular reflection, we used Grasshopper to uh, first generate our geometry uh, in a flexible and adjustable way so that as we refine the design uh, after we had our initial set of analyses and we needed to tweak things, um, we could do that quite easily just by varying a few parameters that we were putting into um, this, this construct, this parametric construct. And the first study that we undertook was uh, more or less a geometric exercise of bouncing light rays and understanding how we would capture them and what times of day they would, they would best bounce down uh, this vertical light shaft um, down to the, the track level and how the specular uh, reflections would likely uh, to behave. So what uh, the tool, the plugin that we used to capture this um, and perform this analysis was uh, Ladybug Tools. And that's a, a suite of open source tools for environmental analysis. And that uh, allowed us to identify the solar vectors uh, at different hours of the year. And uh, also another component allowed us to do the, the reflection and, and bounce uh, and see, trace the path of the light down to the platform level. Next slide, please. So for further studies, uh, building on those initial studies, we wa wanted to include not just the light paths, but also the magnitude of the daylight that would be entering the platform after things like light losses uh, from all the reflections or some of the light uh, not quite finding its way uh, out of the tube. So for that, we turned to Climate Studio, which is another environmental analysis plugin that could work either both in Rhino itself or in Grasshopper. And uh, it, it utilizes radiance as the daylight calculation engine. Uh, it's, and that engine is, is highly validated um, and something that we use uh, quite regularly in our uh, uh, performance analysis practice. So we, we leveraged the Grasshopper tools of Climate Studio because that allowed us to study multiple options and customize the visualization of the results in ways that we thought were going to be useful for really understanding the performance of this uh, uh, system that we were setting up. So the images that I have on the slide here are actually from another uh, one of our projects that's just meant to serve in as an example of Climate Studio's capabilities. Um, in this particular project, we were studying options for type, top lighting and underground uh, space. Um, so somewhat different, um, still an underground space, but um, close enough to the surface that we could uh, bring light in uh, through, through top lighting. Uh, so we use Climate Studio uh, and Grasshopper to generate multiple different design iterations of a few central design concepts. So looking at uh, skylights, um, a shaded skylight, light monitors. So those were some of our main concepts. And then we iterated within those different parameters, such as the type of glass or the spacing of the shading or height of the monitors. And Grasshopper gave us the flexibility to do that in a very quick and consistent manner and um, simulate the different uh, options, automatically record uh, their performance and compose a matrix of the different results like we're seeing on the right hand side of the screen, highlighting the best performers. And we didn't just look at daylight, um, the tools that within Climate Studio uh, gave us the ability to look at um, a variety of different metrics, so daylight, glare, and annual sunlight exposure. The latter two were not really relevant for our case because we were uh, bringing light through the light tubes and diffusing it. But um, we'll get on the next slide, we'll talk about why 
uh, Climate Studio proved to be pretty valuable in this case. And that's really because it was the only software that we were aware of that gave us the ability to model uh, the vertical light tubes. Um, and uh, in this module that allows us to model light tubes, it actually has a an extensive library of the different solar tube projects. Jeff showed the slide earlier on when we were trying to decide which one to use, where we selected a number of different options and were able to parametrically cycle through them to figure out which one would be bringing the, the most amount of daylight uh, down to the platform level. And the way that this module works is less uh, actual bouncing of light, um, which is very computationally intensive, uh, since radiance tends to use a backwards ray trace method. Uh, this would be forward ray tracing, um, and uh, we would have to do something very customized to be able not just to do that, but to do that in a timely manner, uh, because it, it, is, it would be very computationally intensive. Um, but the way this works is by using a split surface BSDF material uh, to replace, to replicate the performance that would exist in the light tube. So what a BSDF uh, material means, so that stands for bi-directional scattering distribution function. So that's a typical material that you would find in radiance that can be specified to scatter light based on uh, the amount of light entering to a surface assigned with that material and its given angle. So it might behave differently at different angles. And uh, the manufacturers the, uh, the of uh, Climate Studio work hand in hand with SolarTube to get all that spectral information correct. And then what they did is they, they kind of split the, uh, the BSDF material so that you have a, have a, a separate um, collector and a separate diffuser, and they could be um, spread apart as opposed to like a single surface, like a piece of glass that you might assume uh, uh, assign a BSDF material and have light entered and reflected and scattered and refracted um, based on the properties that are specified. So this allowed us to measure the magnitude and the angle of the rays entering the diffuser and how going through that tube, it would be scattered and, and uh, uh, distributed out the diffuser in the bottom. Um, now, it also will adjust that. It's not just the product that you picked, but it measures the distance between the collector and diffuser. So, and makes certain, and also the, the horizontal difference between the two, and then makes calculation, affects the, uh, the light loss in the tube based on the length and if uh, you would have to do some uh, 90 degree turns uh, if your collector and diffuser are too far apart one, from one another. So it's actively calculating the differences um, and, and the light loss uh, based on the inputs that are specified. Next slide. And then the final thing in, in the... Um, in our workflow to be able to model the daylight that was coming out of the bottom of uh, the horizontal elements uh, is that we took the results we were getting from the vertical distribution and, um, and then we had to account for additional light loss that would happen with the horizontal distribution. So with the help of Lauren Whitehead, uh, who's a professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of British Columbia, who's also an, an expert in optics, we're able to determine how uh, the one the lumens would likely be distributed before be, between the four horizontal diffusers, and how much light would be lost um, in making that transition between the vertical and the horizontal. So then we used the we took the horizontal the hourly sorry uh, lumen output from the bottom of the light tube, which we calculated in the first step, and um, used that to generate an IS file. An IS file is something that lighting designers use to replicate the light output and um, and the, the intensity and distribution of light coming out of a lighting fixture, 
and that would uh, replicate the light coming out of the tube. And uh, so, and that's something that easily plugged into Climate Studio. And so we just scaled the luminous flux that was coming out of each of the diffusers by uh, the hourly output, which was coming in from the vertical tube. So that, that meant if less light, we, we had those hourly values throughout the day and throughout the year. And so based on the amount of light that was getting into the tube and coming out the bottom, uh, we were able to add on an additional uh, distribution loss for the horizontal horizontals, and then that would help scale the output of the IES file. Next slide. <laughs> so we looked at light level illuminance uh, in two areas. Uh, the most well, the more important is the tactile edge, as we call it, the edge of the platform is a strip about two feet wide, and it's the area of greatest potential hazard where you um, board and disembark the train, and so hence the higher light level. Then uh, there's the waiting area, which is the rest of the platform. So our example station platforms generally serve two tracks our design conducts light to both edges. The calculation results that you will see are separated into zones, the two edges and the center. And then the question is how much light is enough? So this is a listing of standards from transit agencies in the operate in the New York area and also uh, the illuminating engineering society recommendations we have Amtrak uh, the IES the uh, New York City Transit and Port Authority so what we came up with was a range of 50 to 200 lux average at the platform edge and then 25 to 200 lux average in the waiting area uh, to put this into context, emergency egress lighting is generally designed to 10 lux average. That's what it takes to walk safely. And here. So here we're, we're starting to see uh, some of the results of these studies once we've uh, put together all these different softwares and mathematical pro, uh, processes. And the flexibility that Grasshopper gave us in, in terms of coding up our own way of processing the results, we were able to separate the analysis grids between the two edges of the platform, which were that critical tactile edge that Jeff was talking about, and the center of the platform, which would be a kind of nice to have in terms of um, bringing in daylight, but not necessarily that um, concern that we would have about safety um, that, that we would have on the two edges. So here you could see this table that um, we outputted from, from the different simulations. And uh, you could see the, the first few rows relate to the, the center of the platform and the rest are, are those two edges. And then we took the, the sensor nodes that were on the, those grids and uh, at create average hourly values for key times throughout the day and the year in each of those areas, and then extract these values to an Excel file where then we could examine them more closely. So the red in, in the tables indicate the times of a day and year uh, that we were extracting when the luminance target had, uh, that we set for uh, ourselves of this uh, 50 lux has been either uh, met or exceeded. The other colors indicate that there is daylight available and you'll notice that um, a decent amount of them are above that uh, 10 lux threshold that Jeff mentioned for emergency lighting, um, but it's but those 
but they're still below the desired uh, minimum threshold. And what we also noticed about this, and again, we weren't extracting for every month, um, but seeing that we're, we're meeting the targets uh, at least through late December means we're, prob we're also uh, looking at uh, meeting those targets uh, through in, in March and uh, till and beyond, if, if not further, means that we are reaching um, the luminance uh, threshold for at least half of the year. Uh, one of the things that we are noticing is that in, in December, outside of those uh, those months, when the sun altitude is low, the threshold is is not met. So the luminance values uh, that we're seeing are typically highest in the in the midday. That was something that, we, that was in common throughout all of the um, the year. Um, but uh, the values are not necessarily symmetrical uh, around uh, noon, like you would you might expect them to be. Uh, they're actually larger in the morning. But in, in the afternoon, the values uh, uh, tend to be lower, although that's not always true in every case. Next slide. And uh, let me just make a note about the color coding in this system. Red is good. It's uh, like a heat map. Right, and these these diagrams use the same convention as uh, as that table, except instead of um, looking temporar temporarily to uh, through the year, uh, we're lo we're looking spatially on the platform, uh, covering those those grids along the edges as well as the center of the platform, and then similarly color coding it with red if it's above the threshold. Um, and then other colors to indicate uh, where from zero to 50 lux uh, we are heading in terms of our luminance target. So these three tracks are not set three separate tracks, but just different dates of the year at, at 9 a.m. in the morning. And we could see, you know, the best performance is in June. Um, uh, starting to lose a little bit. Um, of light in the center of the platform uh, when we get to se September, uh, but still those edges of the platform look pretty good. And then in December, uh, we are right underneath uh, the, the diffusers um, above that 10 threshold, a 10 lux threshold, but, um, but we're not uh, at anywhere on the either the edges or the center meeting meeting the target. Next slide. But like we like we said when we were looking at the table, we we're we're doing a fair bit uh, better when it comes to the middle of the day, getting more daylight um, on the edges and the middle, uh, and even doing better in December. We're still not hitting the threshold, but we can see that there's there's a, it's definitely brighter uh, down there. And next slide. And then we start to see um, it start to fade away once we, we get uh, through the middle of the afternoon. But having uh, another way of representing these results that are that is more spatial uh, rather than a, a summary table and, and get a feel for um, relative to uh, this, the, the four diffusers where how, how sunlight is distributed and it goes, obviously if we were to continue the grid further, we'd see more, um, more extension on the platform, even if uh, it'll start to fade off at some point. And the reason that we're speculating that we don't see that symmetry around uh, noon uh, is is probably due to the effects of the uh, solar grid of New York City. We're we're rotated. We're not aligning strictly with the cardinal directions, but there's about again 29 degree uh, tilt um, from that. 
and that might be affecting uh, the way the light is uh, is interacting with uh, the surrounding context and uh, the collector. Next slide. And uh, this is what we think it'll look like uh, with this, the rendering that uh, Elliot made of what the platform will, will look like, uh, given the existing structure. Uh, it's been suggested that we add a, a white ceiling over the uh, tubes, the light pipes, in order to produce contrast and distribute the light more evenly. And uh, to the right is the system that I described earlier. Uh, for the contribution of sunlight to be most effective, the electric light should be adjustable uh, such that the two are complementary. The light pipe at the platform is already designed to conduct light from an artificial source. This can be mounted at the free end while sunlight comes through the end connected to the collecting system. A photosensor and dimming control would combine to adjust the electric light level when needed. Uh, this is a common technique that you might know as daylight harvesting. Uh, since we thought about this, it's been suggested that actually we could put an LED strip, strip straight down the spine of the tube and rather than having a special fixture at the end. Uh, in any case, the technology is certainly there to provide a, a complementary system. So having uh, done all this virtually, uh, we got to thinking it would, we'd really like to see this in physical form. Could we do a mock-up? So we talked to folks at SolarTube and at Insight, and we along the way, we got introduced to uh, Lauren Whitehead at the professor at the University of British Columbia and the inventor of the light pipe or smart pipe as it's sometimes known. And I, we had a conversation then with uh, Chris Freuter of Insight Lighting uh, who did the sketch on the left, came to our office and <laughs> Drew on the whiteboard and said, well, we're going to mock it up this way. Here's the solar tube at the, where you see the 29 inch diameter cylinder in the center of the drawing. And then we're going to make these two conductors and somehow connect them to our light pipes. Um, and then uh, the <clears throat> third company got involved and, and we got this diagram on the right from uh, Lauren Whitehead showing a conductor from the going from the vertical tube, uh, getting around the corner somehow and distributing light to the light pipes at the platform edges. So this product development is in the works. Uh, uh, some Someday soon there'll be uh, the possibility of a fully functioning system. Um, also, WSP has uh, won the next phase of design for Penn Station. So I hope that uh, this can happen. It's a real opportunity here uh, to implement what we've shown as possible. Uh, we have many people to thank. And I have to say, first, the project was made possible by a grant from the WSP USA Research and Innovation Fellowship Program. Program committee was chaired by John Munro, Director of Major Projects. Much matching support came from the Transportation Lighting Design Group led by Paul Lutkovich, Senior Vice President. I would say probably twice as many hours from <clears throat> the lighting group as from the original grant. So access to drawings 
of the Empire Penn Station Planning Study was arranged by Sophia Berger, our Senior Vice President at WSP USA. We thank our teammates, Amir Dagami and Josh Broden. Amir uh, kept things constructible. Josh did the early visualizations. We are also grateful for the advice and peer review by the following lighting design professional, Neil Diger at Solitude International, Chris Kreuter at Insight that made the light pipes, uh, Lauren Whitehead, professor at the University of British Columbia, who became an advisor and something of a mentor for all of us. Uh, we had additional assistance from Ken Coulter and Joel Peterson of Wavefront Technology, who are doing the sunlight conductor. That's the critical connecting piece. We drew inspiration from the work of architects David J. Bennett and David A. Ijati, formerly of BRW Architects in Minneapolis, and of the lighting consultant, the late William M. C. Lamb. Thank you very much. Thank you um, for the wonderful presentation, uh, Chairman Elia. That was indeed um, really a great um, how the record sunlight is being converted um, in the early 92 to a functional lighting in inside the tunnel of the train station. It's really, really amazing. Um, we have recorded the um, the presentation. So the PowerPoint is also available at the ESA website. Um, and if you need uh, the CD credit, please sign on to the link that's been posted on the chat. Uh, we, you can receive the CD credit with the link. Um, and does anyone have any questions um, regarding um, our presentation for the speakers? or any comments, uh, please feel free to put it into the chat and we'll pass it along to the speakers. We have, a, we have a lot of um, attendees today. We have a big group among us. Thank you all for coming in. We really appreciate that. Um, I, uh, no one's asked, but uh, I uh, can point out that uh, the results are, I would say, uh, to some extent, deliberately generic. We didn't account for objects around the station, buildings around the station. And uh, there are two reasons for that. One is that we wanted to come up with a, a generic solution. And the other is that it's not at all clear what will be standing or will remain standing or will be built in the neighborhood around Penn Station. So uh, stay tuned. We also have a question coming from Jeff. Um, I'm going to read it out. Are there any concerns about glare? Would you have maximum daylighting of 300, 400 lots? Um, that would have to do with the, the design of the tube, which uh, is meant to distribute light fairly evenly and also the background illumination. So we've shown uh, the devices in a darkened station and that might not be fair. I mean, it might be that way in an emergency, but in uh, normal use, there would be other light uh, to create background illumination. So I don't think uh, there would be a lot of glare. There will always be uh, direct glare from any light fixture. So the question is, how is the light distributed? And I think the, uh, the design of the light pipe handles that uh, pretty much as 
any other light fixture handling it. We have one more question. Um, I'll read it as well. Any further reading regarding the light pipes? Well, I could call on Lauren Whitehead if he would be willing to. I, uh, Jeff, I'd, I'd be very willing, uh, but I'm sorry if you could repeat the question, that would be helpful. I couldn't oh, quite hear. Uh, do you have any further reading regarding the light pipes? Hmm. Uh, I'm sorry, what was meant by reading? In that context. More articles? Oh, reading. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there, there is uh, more information coming out. And uh, maybe I could add um, to this that the idea of distributing, of, of core daylighting, as we're describing here, has been around for a long time. So, for example, there is an Illuminating Engineering Society publication on this topic, which uh, to which Jeff was a major contributor. That goes back a while. And what has changed since then? is a very important thing, which could be summarized with the words, no moving parts. So in the past, if you wanted to do core daylighting as core daylighting as is being discussed here today, it was necessary to have sophisticated uh, solar tracking optics, which was expensive and therefore made it a luxury rather than a practical uh, way to illuminate space at reasonable cost. And that's now solved. And the, the solution arises basically from the advent of better materials and also better design understanding. So these light pipes, these modern light pipes that uh, Jeff and Elliot have described so well, don't require the light that goes into them to be highly collimated. And that means that uh, tracking mirrors are not required. Um, so the net result is the light that comes out of the pipes, as, as Jeff has said, is just light. It's it's it has a better spectral property than most electric lights, uh, but it certainly doesn't have glare. It's just nice uniform light that uh, one would typically hope to see in a space like this. Jeff, I don't know if that's a helpful response. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Um, so we are on the clock. Uh, it's one o'clock. Thank you all for coming in and signing on to the webinar. We really appreciate everyone for coming. Um, if we